Everybody good? Thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to hold this uh, press conference to do two things. I wanted one to release, as I said that I would yesterday, the entire substance of the surveillance videos um, to the public. Now I understand that uh, Prosecutor McCullough did that earlier and I'm very glad. And for those of you that weren't there, um, I have copies of it um, and encourage you to, to pick it up. I've also included on that a cue sheet and that'll take you to the particular places within the video where Michael Brown um, came to the store and the interaction that he had with the clerks that night. This whole ugly issue has been um, brought back into the forefront because of a documentary filmmaker who made an unfounded and baseless claim that the folks at Ferguson Market exchanged uh, merchandise, cigarillos, and it turns out two sodas, and in exchange for a bag of marijuana. That is 100% false. Okay? It did not occur. What the filmmaker did was to um, edit down what is about a four minute interaction in the store down to about 20 seconds, maybe 25 seconds. And in that, and given his narration that went along with it, made it sound like Michael Brown came in, requested the cigarillos, put down a bag of marijuana, grabbed the uh, package with the, the merchandise in it, started to leave, thought, you know what, I'm going to do this on layaway, turned around, gave it back to them, and asked them to hold it until the next morning. What he doesn't say is in the bag there were two sodas, so I don't know why he would have been coming back the next day to pick up two sodas. The entire story is preposterous and laughable. But it's even more so when you look at the video that we're about to watch. Now, normally you would just say this is nonsense and you would dismiss it. The problem is this has caused significant um, harm to this community again. Last night at Ferguson Market, the protesters came back out. Police officers were engaged. Police officers were hurt. Shots were fired at the market and at the police officers. My client's uh, store was threatened to be burned to the ground, and all because some filmmaker badly edited, misedited a surveillance video so that he could get publicity for his documentary film. The film and the proposition for which he's put out there are both false. So what I'd like to do at this point is walk through some of the video show you the distinctions between the two and highlight those things that indicate that no drug transaction occurred that night. This is right here camera six from the surveillance video. The time at the top is 13.33, 1 34 in the morning. Michael Brown is walking into the store right here and what I'd like you to note on this, Michael Brown has one thing in his hand. He has a piece of paper. Okay? He's walking in with a piece of paper and there's nothing in the other hand. All right. Camera seven. Okay, here we go. This is the, a different camera angle. This is the door back here, we'll see. And we'll take it up to where Michael Brown walks into the store. There's Michael Brown walking into the store. He's carrying the piece of paper in his right hand. He's going to spend about 30 seconds here looking around uh, for something to drink up here. In the documentary film, the documentary filmmaker said nothing about sodas because it doesn't fit the narrative that the uh, cigarillos were on layaway. Michael Brown looks through this. I'm going to jump a little bit further ahead because it's to where he decides. Now, I'm going to stop right here. Michael Brown walks up to the counter. He's got two vest sodas in his hand, okay? And he's got the piece of paper also in his hand. He puts them on the counter. That's an employee next to him. The employee backs away. Now, and we're going to flip to another camera angle, but 
what is going to happen occur here is about 30 or 40 seconds worth of discussion and it's become a very heated discussion um, throughout because Michael Brown you're going to see is going to throw up a bag of what looks like marijuana onto the counter and then he's going to start arguing with the, the clerk because the clerk's going to tell him no I'm not taking marijuana get out of my store so as we watch this I'll, I'll show you the point of time which he throws the that's a at 15.10, now right now he's asking for the cigarillos and the clerk's bagging up the sodas, getting the cigarillos off the counter. And at 15.08, you're going to see him go to his pocket, right there, okay? He reaches in his pocket and he throws the, the bag up on the counter, okay? It's right there at 15.09 of the tape. Now, it's going to disappear because, the, as we'll see from the other angle, some of the clerks picked it up and wanted to see what it was. What, that's what you saw in the documentary. Okay? Now, what you didn't see in the documentary was all of this. This is the argument that's going on between Michael Brown and the clerks. What do you mean you, know, you won't barter with me? What do you mean I can't trade with you? Why not? Come on, man. The language got heated and it got ugly. And that's what's going on. You can see him, his hands moving, okay? The body language. The argument's going on. None of this is in the, the documentary. Okay, still arguing. And he's going to get frustrated and he's just going to grab the bag and he's going to walk out. Okay, now, at this point, he's grabbed the bag right there. He hasn't paid for anything. And he's got his white piece of paper in his hand. And the marijuana or the bag is still up on the counter. Now, at this point, he's leaving. White piece of paper, bag, two sodas, cigarillos. Okay? The clerk's going to yell to him. Hey, bring the stuff back. You didn't pay for that. Okay. Now this is what you see in the documentary. Kind of a that kind of going there. Oh, I think I'll leave the cigarillos behind. I'll pick them up tomorrow morning. So you're going to see this. Oh yeah, maybe I'll get these tomorrow morning. He stops right there in the documentary. Okay. Nothing untoward about that. What he leaves out is. Okay, he puts it up and he's just grabbed the pot back. Okay, he's now got it in his hand and he's arguing. See, he's arguing with them. They're not friendly exchanges. Keep this till tomorrow morning so I can come back and get it. He's saying, come on now. Okay, stop. Let me go back one second because this is important. You're going to see him walking out. Remember, he walked in with a white piece of paper in his hand. He's given the bag back. There. He's got the pot in this hand, or whatever that was, and you'll see it. His hand is clasped like that, and he's got his white piece of paper in the other hand. He is walking out of the store. You can see it. See it right there? That. He's taking what he put up onto the counter back out of the store with them. He's not a happy camper. Okay? So we're going to go to the different angle. We're going to go one more time, one more angle. Okay, now this angle is from behind the counter. You're looking out towards Michael Brown at the front. And we'll go up and he comes to the counter at 1440. Yeah, we're a little late. Let's go back at 1440. It's the end of the night. The guys are ready to go home. It's 1.30 in the morning. They usually close at 1.30, but a few customers have come in. So they're hanging out, waiting. Michael Brown comes up. The first thing he does is he puts down the sodas. 
okay? And the cashier going towards the, uh, the cash register, and he's going to ring, start ringing things up and putting them in bags. So see, so he's grabbing the sodas, he's putting them in a bag. Now at this point he says, I don't want two packages of cigarillos. The clerk thought he meant they come in little two packs. So he's going down to get the little two packs. It turns out he says, no, I don't want the two packs. I want the big boxes of them. So you're going to see him kind of go through that. You know, oh, no, no, that's not what I want. Puts them back and he goes up and he's going to go grab the big box of the cigarillos. Okay, and that's what he's putting on the counter. And you're just about to see from this angle, there he goes. See him throw down the package of the little baggie on the right there? Okay. Everybody. Now, yes, the guys pick it up. Okay. They ask, what is that? One guy looks at it. He sniffs it. This guy comes up, says, what the heck? He sniffs it. What is it? Now, unfortunately, this is going to be a little bit, but you're going to watch as he moves across, you're going to see him put this back down onto the, the, ta onto the counter, and you're going to see his hand will be empty, and then he's going to put his hands behind his back just to kind of stand like that, and there's nothing in his hands, okay? So, he's going to put it back down right there, and his hands are empty, okay, and he puts his hands behind his back. It's back up on the counter. Now, we can't see it because... This guy's in front of it. Putting the stuff into the bag. There we go. Now this is the part you saw, just this little snippet right here in the documentary, putting the, the cigarillos in the bag. And then we cut away from, we never see the remainder of this. Okay? And I'm just gonna kinda let this run. Look here, he's like, now he's at the register, pay me. Okay? You're gonna see him kinda go, you're gonna see him say, get the heck out of my store. I'm not taking that. See, get out of my store. I'm not doing that. No, no. No, okay? It's not going to happen. You're going to see Michael Brown. Now, he gets frustrated. Bam, he walks away. Okay? Nothing was exchanged. He didn't pay for the, the merchandise. He was angry. And now watch, he's going to say something, and everyone's going to turn and look to him because he says, hey, bring the stuff back. See? Hey, bring the stuff back. And this guy right here just told him to bring it back. He comes back. He puts it on the counter, and it's at this point that he then grabs the pot back from the counter. Okay? Now, they're going to argue about this for a little longer. Okay? He's got it in his right hand, right there. See? He's arguing. What do you mean? What do you mean you won't do that? He's saying, no, I'm not going to do it. They're trying to ignore him. They're trying to be nice. And out he goes. Okay? Now, if this were a layaway, watch what the, the clerk gives him the kind of the wave off, probably some language. But if this were a layaway, he doesn't he put the bag aside, okay? Just say, put it under the counter. He's going to be back for it. See, he's kind of saying, I don't know what the... He takes that, he restocks it. He takes the two bottles of Vest Soda. He gives it back to that guy. He goes and puts them away. And that's the transaction. Now, then he's going to go from there and he's going to decide, you know what, I better go see what the guy was doing. He wasn't very happy with me. And there he goes. I'm going to show you one more angle, and then I'll take questions. And it's just one shot on this other angle. Sixteen thirty-two. At sixteen thirty-two. You see Michael Brown leave. And you can see him. He's going to be carrying the, the paper in one hand and the, the pot in the other hand. He's going to switch him into one hand so he can use the hand to open the door. Okay. 
right there. And then he uses that hand to open the door, and they were both in his left hand. You could see throughout the video, he came in with a white piece of paper in one hand, went to his pocket, pulled out the marijuana, and when he left the counter, he had the paper in one hand, the marijuana in the other hand, and there was no transaction. That, I dare anyone to tell me that that looked like a friendly interaction between people that knew one another and were offering to hold cigarillos till the next morning for this individual. That was a heated argument, an exchange. Numerous times you saw him tell him to get the heck out of his store. There was no exchange. And when you take all of that out, like the documentary filmmaker did, yeah, you can edit down anything. That's what you all do. You edit video. We can all make it look like something happened, and that's what the documentary filmmaker did. In fact, when you watch this all the way through, you realize that it was a much different story and nothing occurred. So, again, why the documentary filmmaker chose uh, to do this, I have no idea. But he went out on the circuit and he made these wild allegations that have caused tremendous grief in the community, put lives at risk last night, um, and, and I think it's shameful uh, what he's done. More importantly, he never once came, he said he spent two years in Ferguson making this documentary. He never once came and talked to the clerks about what happened that night. He never went through and came to me and said, because I have this, you all know where to find me, everyone knows where to find me when it comes to Ferguson. Nobody ever sat down and said frame by frame, what happened here? No, what he did is he took 20 seconds and then added a wild story to it and put it out there and, and, and really opened up that, that whole kettle of fish that has been Ferguson that we thought we were starting to get over, that we were starting to heal from. And as of last night, we took five steps backwards. And he owes an apology to these folks here. He owes an apology to the city of Ferguson. He owes an apology to the police officers who put their lives on the line last night because of his recklessness. I'll be happy to take questions. Two things. Is there audio? No. There's no audio. No audio. There is no audio on the surveillance. It's not just here. There's no audio, period. What made him think he could go into a store, that store which he apparently frequented, and do a barter deal? Okay, first of all, another faulty premise, okay? He did not live here. He did not come in the store. This was maybe his first time in the store, maybe his second time in the store. But he was, did not frequent this store. He didn't live in the area and think he had been staying with his grandmother. So um, that's the first thing. Second, I don't know why he thought he could come in and do that. What made him think he could come back the next day and steal the, the cigarillos? I don't know what was going through his mind. But if your question is aimed more at what this... Uh, filmmaker has also been saying that somehow this is a, a known location for drug dealing, I would say that is absolutely false inside this store. What goes on in the parking lot, beside it, at McDonald's, down the street, you know, I don't know. But there is no evidence that anyone in this store has ever engaged in drug dealing, and if they did, if they did engage in drug dealing, it's 1.30 in the morning, they're about to get off, it's Friday night. What better time to go ahead and, and engage in that kind of activity? Why put yourself at risk with a very large man who's very angry with you and send him away empty-handed? Doesn't make any sense. Why didn't you release the video back then? Okay, and again, there was no, the store turned over the entire DVR. These things are just like in your home. All these cameras load into a DVR, and that DVR, they couldn't copy it. The St. Louis County Police, in conjunction with the FBI and others that were investigating, uh, served a search warrant on Ferguson Market in the first week. They turned over the entire box, okay? The box. They had to get a new security system and I don't know that I remember getting it back some 18 months later, okay? So we didn't have anything. We gave that to the police. We gave that to the FBI, to the Justice Department. What they then did with it, I don't know. Now, I then got the box back some 18 months later, 
because as a result of the civil suit that is going on between the Brown family and the city of Ferguson, they, in that, came to us and said, you own the surveillance footage. Can we, we're going to serve a subpoena on you to get that for the civil suit. I then went to St. Louis County. I said, are you done with the, the box? They said, yes. We made copies and gave it to the attorneys for the city of Ferguson. And we gave it to the attorneys for the Brown family. The Brown family has had this video since last October. Okay? They did not first hear about this as a result of the documentary film. They've had this same video for months. So to say, why did we not turn it over? For 18 months, we, we couldn't physically do it. And the only time we ever turned it over to anyone was by, because of a subpoena served on us in a federal lawsuit, and that required us to make a copy and give it to them. And nobody's touched our DVR since then. Do you know how Pollock got it, the documentary? I, ha I have my suspicions. I mean, you think about who are the people that have copies. Bob McCullough's office has a copy. The FBI has a copy. The Justice Department, I assume, had a copy. The attorneys for the city of Ferguson had a copy. And the Brown family had a copy. So, so what are your and your clients' concerns going forward? The concerns are that we should not let a false video, fake news, to use the term that everyone's using these days, fake news, you know, let the violence start back up to stop the healing, okay? My clients had nothing to do with Michael Brown's death on Canfield. They just didn't. Um, and to suggest otherwise, recklessly, like this video does, um, is scary. Uh, what we want to see is let's stop the violence, um, let's move in the direction that we were headed in, which was the healing. This is not to say that everyone um, can't have their feelings about Michael Brown's shooting and what occurred and, and what happened with St. Louis County. All I'm here to address is this didn't happen, okay? So there's no reason to threaten to burn down this store. There's no reason to shoot at this store. They did nothing. If you wanted to address your anger, I would turn it around back on the filmmaker and ask him why did he think he could get away with this and impose this kind of hurt on a community that leads it, needs it the least. Are you going to take any action against the uh, documentarian? You know, you know, I, I don't want to, this has all been, happened, you know, it's been 48 hours now, and we, the thing that we wanted to do, and, you know, we spent two hours last night locked in the store because of the gunfire, and so we need time to think this through, but this is wrong, okay? It's just, it's just false, and, and something should be done, and that's up to my clients, and I'll spend time with them talking about what um, remedies are available to them. Right. All day. Are you going to try and go on there with this video I, to I, try and quash any of this? Yeah. Because it's, it is revving up. There's no right. I spent the afternoon with CNN, and, um, and that's just to say, the answer to your question, yes. And they have this video, and, and I'm, I, I walked through just like I've done with you here with CNN. That's the reason we're coming out with this. I mean, he is out there promoting a false narrative and a very dangerous false narrative. And it's got to be stopped right here so that St. Louis at least can say, all right, we have better things to do with our time than to, to talk about this anymore. All I want is this to end right here, okay, this part of it, the Michael Brown part, what happened, you know, where the future of this community is and race relations and other things, you know, that's going to go on for years. But this part needs to stop today. It didn't happen. And I, I, I feel bad that, you know, that, you know, here's, I feel like I have to focus on this, this, because that's what my clients and, and what's been aimed at my clients as a result of this. But the truth of the matter is, even if this were true, it had nothing to do with Michael Brown and Officer Wilson. Officer Wilson and Michael Brown interacted because Michael Brown was in the middle of the street and they had that interaction. It had nothing to do with whether or not a, uh, a robbery had been committed at the store. So again, 
you know, it is kind of, you know, focusing on the wrong part of the story, even if it was true. And sadly, it's not even true. So given that people are concerned about possible protests and things going forward, how would you handle something like that? Well, we, I, you know, again, I went out to the protesters last night <laughs> with mixed results um, based on what was on, uh, I guess, on Mr. Courier's uh, web page and said, listen, folks, you have to see the video, okay? You're out here protesting. You're angry at them about something that did not happen, okay? Um, and what I'm trying to do, and I've made the offer to, um, to members of the community, members of the protest community, and trying to say, I'd be happy to sit down with anyone and walk you through this video, and I will show you what happened and what didn't happen. And you may think that, you know, that may not change your mind, but at least you will have seen it. At least you will have heard it from me. At least we can have a discussion about it, and then you can make up your mind. But to go out based on a 20-second snippet and some, um, you know, narration um, that it just is, is false, you know, that's just, you know, it's just lazy journalism. It's, it's, it's awful. So I want to have that discussion. I want people to see this. I want people to ask questions, and I want people to make up their own mind. No. So that's based on your reading of this? No, this is based on, this, right. Clerks? So as I say things, as I have gone through this and I've added commentary to it, you know, I just want you to know, there is no um, um, audio in this surveillance, okay? So nobody has audio, never did, never will. I have spent a lot of time with the people that were there that night. Going all the way back when this first came out, I've known about this Friday night event from the very beginning, and I always wondered why people didn't talk about it. It didn't matter to me. But, so I've known about it. I've had the conversations, and I've spent over the last 48 hours a lot of time with my clients, and I've sat down with them and walked them through. And some of the language that was used, I can't use here, okay? So I've modified it. But... I've been through it over and over again, and that's what they said, that's what he said, that's what happened. You mentioned that you talk, reached out to the protest community and some of the people. Have you gotten any response back? I have not. I have not had anyone take up my offer to sit down with me and go through the video. And, um, but that offer remains open. It remains open for tonight, for tomorrow, for the remainder of the week, for any time they want to sit down and have that conversation. I have no idea whether the Browns got it in 2014. They have had it since at least October of 2016. And why is that? Is that the civil case? The civil case. It was turned over. Uh, we provided copies to their attorneys and to the attorneys for the city of Ferguson and the defendants. Do you think this filmmaker had any reason to, to say what he did? And he's sticking with what he said, and he says nobody has evidence to serve otherwise. I just, you, you came in a little bit late. So, okay. Um, again, I, all I can say is if anybody here that has watched this entire video and listened to what the commentary was, um, and even if you take the commentary away and look at the body language and the hands and what was in the hands and what wasn't in the hands, and you can you know, honestly look me in the eye and say, that was a transaction, a barter transaction, a layaway like it was Macy's, um, you know, for some cigarillos and um, two bottles of vest soda, well, you know what? You're entitled to your opinion. But I don't think any of the evidence demonstrates that. And if he wants to stick to his story, you know, that's his prerogative. Are you going to release any more, um, any transcripts or any more eyewitness accounts from your clients or people who have been there? Um, I, I don't believe so, and again, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I want this to end, okay? I don't want this to drag out. I don't want this to be a daily, you know, what's going to come out today or tomorrow or the next day. Let's have conversations. I want it to end today, and this should be plenty to have it end today. Yeah, Mr. Pollack wants to go out and continue on the circuit and spew forth his lies. That's his prerogative, but he does so at his own risk based on this evidence. On CNN today, he said, bring it on to you 
specifically. And you know what? That is documentary marketing 101. You pick up any documentary book out there, and it says, now you've finished your documentary, we have to market it. So you're going to a film festival. If you did a, festival, if you did a documentary about dogs, and okay, start a controversy, get the local dog pound involved, get people excited, get people angry. It's a way of generating publicity. He would love a lawsuit. You know why? Because it would continue the conversation. That's what he wants. He wants to stress about it. I want to end it today. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Again, I have cue sheets and I have copies of the, um, the, the, the video uh, for you all.